My garden is the world, and that, that's what I've always had a lust for exploring. Welcome to Island Influencers, where we share stories of successful business owners, experienced professionals, entrepreneurs, and community leaders based or with influence in the Isle of Man. This podcast is brought to you by Thornton Chartered Financial Planners, because great financial planning has the power to change your life. Now here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner, Sharon Sutton. Another lockdown, another new season of Island Influences. This week's guest is Neil Morris, Managing Director of Manx Bird Life. In his spare time, Neil also continues to act as Secretary of the Qatar and Manx Bird Records Committee. Neil graduated from Bristol University with a Bachelor of Science, joined honours in both botany and zoology, after which he pursued a marketing career with the National Trust, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, the RSPB, and the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, the RNLI, which of course has its roots in the Isle of Man. The opportunity for his wife, coupled with a desire for a change of life, came just at the right time, and Neil and his young family moved from London to Qatar, where he indulged his passion for nature conservation, photography, and ornithology in the desert. Luckily for us, he then moved to the Isle of Man in 2014, and we truly benefit from his knowledge, expertise, and passion. Listening to Neil's life and business lessons should set us all on the right path for 2021. Here's this week's conversation with Neil Morris in episode 34 of Island Influences. Welcome, Neil Morris of Manx Bird Life uh, to the podcast, um, to Island Influences. Um, Neil, it's lovely to meet you um, because I believe you've um, you found yourself in the Isle of Man relatively recently to... um, to, to, to many of us. And um, so I wonder if you'd mind telling us um, all, all about yourself, where you've come from. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I started life in the Sussex commuter belt of Heath, And uh, I suppose the most eventful part of my young life was that my father died when I was 12 years of age. Oh, um, and it, it sort of set the course for the family thereafter. And my Mother, bless her, did an amazing job of bringing up three children. Yeah. We never felt like we wanted for anything. Um, but it, it, it certainly shaped, I suppose, my early life and many of the habits that I have yeah. now. So what were, your, did you have, uh, what were your siblings, older, younger? I have a sister who's a year older yeah. and a brother who's five years younger. Gosh. So that's quite a stretch. It is. And it's for, been so for my difficult. Mother, yeah to bring the three of us up. And we were very lucky. We were in a good part of the world. Mm. Um, as I say, we didn't want for anything. But I, I did find myself at a very early age um, developing this very practical side, and I think it was a bit of a coping mechanism. Uh, I, I would notice that my sister was reading something uh, intelligent, such as Zola or other novels, and I would be sitting there reading Look and Learn and encyclopedias and just absorbing as much information about the world around me as I possibly could do. Yeah, did you come to become the, the man about the house, so so to speak? I guess I did. I, I, I guess being that much older than my brother, uh, I was the one who was cutting the lawn, fixing the lawnmower. Uh, I was also the one out with my protractor, making sure that my lines on the lawn were straight. <laughs> Great. <laughs> up, up to standard. I've, I've, I've just always had this very practical uh, bent to me. And... Uh, that, that has driven both my personal life and my business life. And uh, I, I tend not to be too introspective or too reflective. Uh, I very much focus on outcomes, outputs. And it's interesting that you, you don't tend to rationalize this stuff as, as you, you go along. It's something you do look back on and you realize it's a bit of a trait and a bit of a theme. In much of what I've done, and I think I think some of that will come out in the conversation we have about my uh, my professional life. Yeah, yeah. So, what what did your dad do? What was what was his profession? He was chief accountant for Rediffusion. Right. And um, one of the great benefits of that is that they were right at the sharp end of technology in the day. So we were very lucky to have one of the very first colour televisions ever in the country. Yeah. And of course, you look back on that, and you almost took it for granted at the time. But the transition from watching things like um, Crossroads in black and white to watching colour TV, it will mean nothing to the kids of today. I remember it very well. But at the time, it was absolutely everything. It was fantastic. It was the major 
technological development of its day. And I, I remain in awe of technology. You know, when you think that technology is about bits and bytes, yes and no's, noughts and ones. Yeah, sure. And a whole stack of those put together in a very clever way gives us all the communications, telecoms that we have today. Mm. It, it's um, it's awe inspiring. Yes. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, and so what, how did your mum um, cope with, with, with what happened? Did, did you, how did you, to, how did you go to school? What, what, did anything change particularly about that? No, about I, th- I think we just got on with life. Yeah. I th- and I think that's always been my, my mantra, just, just to get on, not, not to dwell. Um, you know, ev- everything that's past is history and everything that's out there for the future is an opportunity. So I think we just as a family have that very practical way of getting on and dealing with things, making yeah. ourselves busy. And I think, I think that was when I started to move from absorbing knowledge to going out and using that knowledge. So I've been burying myself in wildlife encyclopedias. I, uh, Jacques Cousteau was an early hero of mine. Yeah. Uh, I was going to be the next great Jacques Cousteau. You know, I wasn't going to be an astronaut. I was going to be a marine biologist. That was the plan. Right. Um, so, so what happened? Well, to, to, to move forward a few years, um, when I started to do my subaqua training, yeah. um, discovered that it was being done in a quarry in Swindon in winter with the visibility of zero, and it didn't have quite the same appeal. Right. And uh, so I, I decided to, to duck out of that uh, training. Yeah. And as I guess I did a, an awful lot, I, I ducked out and went bird watching. Right. And um, just, just found that as such great escapism. Yes. Um, you know, it was quite interesting with the family because I, I would disappear off on the bicycle for hours on end. My... my I don't know what I put my mum through, but I would disappear after breakfast and never appear again till dinner. So what age were you when you started to, to do that sort of thing? I was 11 or 12 when I started doing that. Gosh. And uh, we moved house and uh, we had a, a neighbour, Ian Williams, who's a, a good pal to this day, discovered we both liked doing the same thing. So together we would go off on the bicycle as often as, as going off on our own. And I'd come back at the end of the day and the, the family meal would be on the table. Um, and at some point, you know, the family would ask, what have you done today, Neil? What have you seen? And before I could get the word gold crest or kingfisher out, you know, they would be upstairs, doors would be closed behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <did. laughs> I'd be left to my own devices. My family's never quite understood the birdwatching thing. No, oh, OK. But it has served me well personally for all sorts of reasons. Right. It's, uh, so that was a, an early hobby, really. So what, what about school? What did you, did you um, transcend that sort of interest within your your scholarly pursuits? Um, a, a deep love of biology. That was certainly my favourite subject at school. Yeah. Um, but as often as not, it was me interrupting the class. And I can remember we had a German teacher whose name was Mr Britton, which I always, I always found amusing. And uh, sitting in his class in, in the winter looking out the windows and pointing at the migrating flocks of red wing and field fair, which meant absolutely nothing to my classmates. But of course, you know, I had read the book. I realised they came in from Scandinavia. They were, they were there for the winter and they'd be off again in the spring. And um, it, I think it more bemused people than um, it, it, it was never very cool in those days. Um, certainly through my teenage years as a bird watcher, I made every effort not to wear green. Uh, always <laughs> wanted to be something different. Um, but I, but I, I think it was a great way to discover the world. And, and that's absolutely central to, to me these days. Um, my, my garden is, is not the sort of the square patch of grass at the back of my house. My, my, my garden is the world, and that, that's what I've always had a lust for exploring. Okay, so did you, um, when you, when you did um, your schooling, you, t- you went eventually to Bristol University, didn't you? So I did. What, what, um, how did you, what was the pathway there? What, what were you going to... <sighs> Well, it was the interest in biology, and I, mm. and I wanted to do biological sciences. I actually was looking for an ornithological course, and the only one at the time was, I believe, St. Andrews. But it seemed a long way from the family. Um, we, we were a very um, close-knit family. So I didn't want to be that far away. I wanted my independence, but I didn't want to be the other end of the country. Yeah, sure. And I settled for a botany zoology joint ons in Bristol. Yeah. Um, enjoyed that hugely. Um, but there was always that, that ornithological side to it. Um, you know, this, this course was split between looking at plants down a microscope or dissecting frogs. I know yeah. it's not quite the thing to do now. 
but I, I found dissecting. I think it still is actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I found dissecting frogs a yeah. sight more interesting yeah. than, than looking at million year old plants down a microscope on a right. slide. Yeah. And it's that zoological interest. Um, I have a deep interest in physics as well, um, which fascinates me. And I, 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 th- I think we all need a hinterland, and having those sorts of passions um, outside of your professional life actually can lend a lot to your professional life because you bring a, a, a drive, an energy, a passion um, into whatever you do. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I agree totally with what you've just said there. Yeah. So from, from, uh, from Bristol, then what happened? Well, my ambition was always to work for the RSPB, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Yeah. And I ended up doing a couple of seasons with the National Trust, um, Where down were you in based? Sussex, Sheffield yeah. Park in Sussex, right. which was one of the busier of the National Trust properties. Okay, was that like an in, was it an internship or a proper job or? Um, it was working in the visitor centre. Okay, and uh, in retail, so may, maybe a slight sense of the future there that I yeah. was sort of mixing a bit of uh, conservation yeah. with um, marketing. Yeah. And over two seasons, I learned an awful lot about how some of the commercial world worked, um, about visitor management. You know, we would have days when we would have 5,000 people queuing at the door before nine o'clock in the morning. Mm. Um, I learned how to break into cars because invariably there was somebody on the day who had locked their keys in the cars. <laughs> okay, it's a handy skill to have, arguably. <laughs> well, it used to be before this day and age of immobilizers. Yeah, and, sure. Uh, <laughs> electronic buttons but it was always interesting the reaction it got because people would come in obviously upset they'd lock their keys and worrying about getting home and they yeah. had kids to get back to and of course you'd say hang on a minute wait here and you'd go out with the usual bit of plastic tape and within five minutes once you'd sort of got the knack you could come back and say your car's open and so you would, you would watch people go through this process of delight that you would help them out and then slowly the furrow would appear on their brow and say, gosh, was it really that easy? And they'd start to you know, worry about the security of their car. So again, watching people going through those emotions um, <laughs> was interesting because you, yeah. you know, when, you're, when you're visitor facing, you have to deal with all sorts of situations. Oh, sure. So in, in, in a funny way, it was, Great quite, grounding for it life. was quite a good grounding, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but I've actually secured a job at the RSPB. Um, that had been what I was gunning for. And I thought the route would be that I'd uh, be assigned to a nature reserve in some wild remote part of Scotland and yeah. I could go out and I, I could indulge myself in maybe a bit of fencing, ditching, uh, yeah. but a lot of bird watching. Yeah. But I ended up in the marketing department. Right. Which was totally, um, in, t- in terms of a career choice, like something I wouldn't have thought of. But it was explained to me that they quite liked me. They wanted to employ me. And they weren't going to give me the job that I initially interviewed for, but they had another job which needed doing. It was a six-month uh, marketing promotions thing. And, of course, I wanted to work for the RSPB. Yeah. So I said, yes, I'll do anything. It's exploiting your you know, passion, really. I'll clean the grout between the tiles if it's working <laughs> yeah. for the RSPB. Yeah. And that, that, that led to six and a half years developing my marketing Mm-hmm. Um, knowledge and skills. Did they put you on additional uh, learning courses, that sort of thing? Do you know, I was really lucky, and I, and I think that's the one thing I look back on um, in in my early roles that I had some brilliant mentors, and I, and I have to name them by by person because there are some very high profile characters at RSPB who've done a fantastic role. But it's sometimes the unsung heroes. So the like likes of perhaps Peter Holden and Wendy Driver had a huge influence on me and the fact they gave me the latitude to learn, to make mistakes and to learn from those mistakes and were, were absolutely supportive of me wanting to learn. Gosh. So I attended all sorts of training programs and yeah. indulged myself in all sorts of reading and books and conferences and it, was, it was tremendous. Oh gosh, that's, uh, that's, that's great. I mean, it's a... You know, I, I, I'm going to ask you later about um, about tips for entrepreneurs and business owners. But goodness me, I mean, that's uh, that's that's key right there. I think I think the reason it worked, and I go back to this practical thing. I've always been very numerate. I've always looked um, to do things in an evidence-based way. So I think that's a fairly modern way of describing it. Yeah. But I was always looking for the reason, the logic, the rationale, 
and RSPB were, were surprisingly sophisticated in their marketing, and it was very much database-driven yeah. or data-driven marketing. And of course, now we call that evidence-based. Yeah, we do. And so many things. <laughs> and it had a discipline to it, and it meant that you did things in a way that you could test, you could measure, you could look for, the, for where the improvements were, you could look for where the weaknesses were. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't always so predictable. You could take elements from two different brilliantly performing ads, combine those two elements and think you'd have a, a sort of a superhero ad. Yeah. And then that ad would absolutely bottom out. Ah. Um, and, Human and psychology. Absolutely. And that was <laughs> always... Uh, the thing that was difficult to grapple with, of course, but it, 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 it was it was a very numerous approach um, to marketing, which appealed to me hugely, and that that's how I became involved very much in direct marketing and yeah. database marketing. No, that's that's uh, that's fascinating. Yes, that it should also apply in marketing. Of course, it does. Yeah. So, so what happened uh, um, after after that? You you um, I understand you had a, a, a dalliance or a, even more of a commitment with the the RN RNLI. Yes, I, I moved on from the RSPB. I made the decision that as much as I loved the RSPB and the cause, that um, I needed to forge a career for myself, um, a bit of financial security. I think we were all, all on agricultural wages at the time at the right. RSPB. Okay. That, that was where they sent their, they, they set their salary scale. Ah. Early days, of course. Yes. And I went to the lifeboats, and um, it was really taking that, that numerous approach to marketing and subscription management to the RNLI. And um, we had something like a million members and donors on the database. And it was an interesting challenge. Um, the challenge at RSPB was to grow. It was at that time when you had World Wildlife Fund, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, all very high profile, growing very quickly. And it was a race to growth. For RSPB, it was about the bigger we are, the better the, the conservation job we can do. For the lifeboats, they were already very big, very successful, had a, a wonderful um, heritage. Um, and the, the, the objective there was not necessarily to grow the funds because they were generating enough money to run the lifeboats as they were at the time. And indeed, they, they had about £100 million in the bank as a reserve, which was often criticised. Um, the job was to learn what would happen if some sources of fundraising dried up and legacies was always the big yeah. predictable but unpredictable source of income. Yeah, like most charities actually. Yes, you, you, you think of it as being very hard to generate mm. and yet if you've, you, you've, you've got your communications right and you're a long established charity, it is one of the most predictable sources of income year on year. And for the RNLI, um, it was hugely important to yeah. the, the continuation of the service. And, yeah. and, and so that was the time when I think legacy income was starting to slow down. And they were very worried that they didn't understand marketing. And it was trying to understand where the taps and the levers were, such that as one source of revenue started to decline, yeah. you could turn the different taps on yeah. to replace that income. So marketing was all about learning, yeah, sure. and to learn you need data. Yeah, I mean you, you've come along so, so far. You've come such a long way from a botany and zoology degree um, to, to to understanding the numbers and the the taps and the the levers. You know that's uh, levers. Sorry, yes, the yes. levers. Lever, levers is US. Sorry, um, yeah. Gosh, and and it certainly wasn't planned. Um, I've always been lucky to indulge myself in doing what I felt was worthwhile and enjoyable. I haven't set myself a, a, a career target that every five years I have to be there on that. I've, I've just always wanted to feel what I was doing was worthwhile and to get the satisfaction from it being meaningful. And, I, and I've been lucky to yeah. do that. So the RNLI, it's, it's, it's got quite deep roots with the Isle of Man, actually. Did that have any... Did you, did you know that at the time? or? Well, I... I was aware of um, the RNLI's foundations being in the Isle of Man, but I never got to travel here. I, I, I got to travel quite a bit with the RNLI to, to the different regions and yeah. communities. Um, it was really important to meet the people who were at the front end of the service because 
that is where it is life or death. Mm, indeed. And sometimes being sat in an office playing around with data sheets, you, you can lose sight of that. And in fact, one of the, the great satisfactions that we always found was that no matter how difficult a week we'd had with bureaucracy, with technology, whatever, you always knew that perhaps something somewhere in what you had done that week had made a lifeboat person's life easier. Yeah. And therefore they were able to do um, a better job in saving lives. And that, that was always very satisfying. Yeah. Because those were the days when people were moving from mainframe computers to desktop computing. And I had to justify having a computer on my desk when I arrived at the RNLI because everything was mainframed right. and everything re required requisitions. <clears throat> so the whole idea of running a real-time marketing campaign, running the stats, deriving the analyses and then changing what we were doing midstream to make it better was sort of impossible when you're trying to um, uh, run queries via memos down to a mainstream and having to wait two weeks for those queries to come back to you so i ended up writing a, a memo i got myself into hot water actually because um, my first memo was rejected <laughs> so i took myself down to the it director and said look i really need this and i had to write two more memos and in the end um it got escalated up to the director of the the lifeboats a gentleman called richard miles um commander richard miles who was a terrific gentleman and um I, I was a very junior member of staff, but he sat me down. He said, why do you need a computer on your desk? Why are you making trouble? And I explained, you know, you're expecting me to spend a million pounds and bring five million pounds in. You're expecting me to learn this. Here's the detail of what we're trying to do. I can't do it with a calculator. And within a week, I had a PC on my desk and we were able to do all the things that we were trying to do an awful lot quicker yeah. and real-time management of campaigns became a possibility. Gosh, what, what sort of era was that? What sort of year was that? This was the early 1990s. Right. So if we think about the commercial web really coming on mm. stream in 96, it was prior yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. And in fact, I, I, I lived through the um, birth of the commercial um, internet, the web as we, we now know it, um, in my early years at the Institute of Direct Marketing and marketing f for for the institute was very much a a database operation. Yeah. And so you went to you went to that institute after the RNLI then. Yes, and I feel very guilty about that because again the RNLI were terrific. Um, Ian Ventham was a, a great mentor there, and again very enlightened, could see the benefit of training and education. So I had access to a lot of learning. And um, ended up taking a postgraduate uh, diploma in direct marketing. Uh, I think I was top UK student in the year that I, I um, graduated in that. And I got a knock on the door from the organisation that had run the qualification to say, will you come and work for us? Wow. Um, I can't use the word poached, can I? But effectively, that is what it was in those days. Yeah. And they said, we're an educational organisation, we want to become an institute, a professional institute, um, will you come and help us make that transition? Right, okay, so they wanted to become a, um, a Royal Charter company as opposed to an institute? They wanted to become an institute, Yeah. And, and of course institute is one of those preserved names that if you want to put it in, into your incorporated title, you, you have to go through various yeah. checks and balances. Um, we didn't go far as Privy Council right, Chartership. Okay. Um, because that, that came with an awful lot of baggage. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, and, and we, I always like to think of the, um, the Institute of Direct Marketing as the Apple and the Charter Institute of Marketing as the Microsoft. We were a bit like the new kids in town. We had a different way of doing things. Okay. The Charter Institute, hugely successfully successful, a, a, a tremendously important organisation. But we just had a different spin on things. Well, we yeah, with digital marketing as part of it, I guess that's um, yeah, that's, that's fairly obvious in the in the title, isn't it? Yes. I suppose. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And and we could see that. Um, with the commercialisation of the internet, there were huge marketing implications and opportunities. And I think a lot of the advertising world was quite slow to change. Um, mass communication, the um, the Elgov way yeah. of doing things was, was very established and, and, and set. 
So we had the opportunity to show a slightly different way of doing it. Right. Um, and direct marketing um, was, was very much a catalogue and mail-based activity yeah. um, initially. But um, with the invent, uh, ad- advent of, of databases that you could have on your desktop rather than 50 miles away or in an, or in an underground bunker yeah, sure. and sending requisitions that okay. took two weeks to get through. Yeah. You were at the helm. You had your dashboard. You were managing marketing. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I would like to, to claim that one of the innovations I brought to the RSPB was um, advertising by fax. <laughs> Not doing advertising by fax, but managing advertising campaigns by fax. Right. I can't even imagine how you'd do that these days. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, in, in the old days, it was worse than that because you basically had your ad concept sent to you on a phone board by the agencies. Right. And you would then send back a bunch of notes, post it back. The bits of artwork on the board would often fall off. So you had to sort of guess. <laughs> how the advert actually looked. Right. And you'd have this exchange of Kappa board with bromide oh. patches on it. Yeah. And um, you know, I just said, this is ridiculous. This is taking too long. So we, we trialled proofing by fax. Not possible with colour advertising, but no. with black and white advertising, we could do that. Yeah. And so we speeded up the process from a sort of a three-month development programme. We could get things out within a week. And part of that was trying to react to some of the emergencies that were happening. Oh, yeah, of course. The major oil spill up in the Shetlands. He yeah. wanted to get some advertising out that right. week. Okay, yeah. We couldn't have done it any other way. No, I see. This is all forerunner of social media and all, all the rest of it. Yes, yeah. yes. No, great. So um, when uh, when you were, you'd done your stint at the, the, the Institute of Direct and Digital Marketing, you um, you moved outside of the UK. Yes, we we got to a stage after 18 years with the Institute where we had been through three uh, recessions, been through an awful lot. Uh, the, the team had changed a lot. And for a number of reasons, it felt right to leave. We also, as a family, had got to the stage with, with my own son and my daughter and okay. my, my wife's role where we, we, we just realised that there was an opportunity to change. So um, when did you meet? When did you meet your wife? What what, what stage were you at then? Um, I met her in the early nineteen nineties. Okay, uh, we got married in nineteen ninety four. Yeah, and um, we we now have a a twenty year old and a twenty five year old, um, which is quite a scary thought actually. Yeah. Um, but we we spent most of our, our life gravitating around London, trying mm. to balance her career, my career, and uh, all the commutes in between Oof. with yeah. childcare and everything, and. You know, when you wake up on a Monday morning and the bridges across the Thames are open and the motorways are running freely and there are no leaves on the train lines, it, it's amazing how much you can then pack into your week ahead. And if you get yourself organised, you, you can do an awful lot. But of course, one bridge goes down over the Thames or one motorway gets shut or a train um, gets derailed or the train uh, le- le- leaves on the line. And the whole week falls apart and you spend your whole week trying to play catch up. Mm. And I think we'd had enough of it, to be quite honest. And uh, we felt there was a a, a better way to lead our lives. Very luckily, my wife got a contract in health out in uh, Qatar. Right. Had that come at any other stage of our lives, you know, we would have done the pros and cons and ended up not going probably yeah it was, it was it's ch- uh, children's stages of education as well absolutely yeah but it just happened at the right time right and so we took the plunge we moved out to qatar yeah um and we had two very good years as a family living and working out right there. good school out there yes we have, the the children went to uh, doha college um, which is a terrific education institution mm. so what did you do there I didn't have a job. It was my wife who secured yeah. uh, the contract out there. I can't imagine you twiddling your thumbs, O'Neill. No, no <laughs> I, I, I got I um I got myself stuck into pursuing photography, bird watching. I mean, quite frankly, I was having a breeze for a while because I would drop the children off at school, head off into the desert, spend the whole day getting sunburnt, dehydrated, <laughs> hopefully with a few photographs in the can, pick up the children from school, come back, do the meals. And then we were into the next round of the day because the the day started at five in the morning um, because everything happened too hot to avoid the heat. Mm. Um, 
But I, I got myself very involved in the local natural history scene with the Qatar Natural History Group. Yeah. And then um, a very good pal of mine um, was working in the Ministry um, of, of the Environment. And so I got involved with some projects there as well. Gosh, it sounds fascinating. So were, were there many, um, was, was the local government, were they sort of involved? Was that who you were working with or was it? E- eventually, it took yeah. a while. Uh, Qatar's a fascinating place. Um, it's small. It's about the size of the two Yorkshire counties combined. And um, the, the, the Qatari nation then was about a quarter of a million citizens. Um, but there were about 1.25 million immigrants and expats right. actually developing and running the country. Um, so it, it was quite a, a strange society to be part of. But um, it's not perfect. But I, I, I developed a huge respect for the Cattery people, for the Cattery friends uh, that we came to know um, and had some terrific times, some wonderful hospitality. And for me personally, the geography of the Middle East is just wonderful and the wildlife, you know, a desert is not just sand. A desert is complex. So to discover uh, yeah, sure. how a desert functions no, and to sure. see it. But I guess it's nothing like the salmon uh, fishing. Well, was it what was the movie called? Fishing in the Yemen. Fishing in the Yemen. <laughs> no, but but I recognised parts of that in the the life that we had out there for a period. Yeah. Um, you you go from the highest level of sophistication, the most, the highest, the greatest opulence. Mm. Um, per capita, it's the richest country in the world. Yeah. Um, if you're if you're born a Qatari. Um, is, is essentially you're wealthy for life. So it's a very different view of things. But there was poverty and yeah. there was hardship. And um, you, you, you saw that all within a quarter of a mile um, of where you lived, um, yeah. all sides of it. And um, what, what struck me, and again with my environmental interest, was just how quickly a society like that can move from being a desert-dwelling nomadic society essentially to being one of the richest societies in the world and and gathering all the accoutrements of wealth and actually it's money doesn't bring you happiness you know that's the message that it brings a lot of anxiety a lot of stress and we met many um local people who sought solace in the harshness of the desert um, and, and they, I suppose, like all of us parents who are frustrated at, at technology, um, children with their, you know, children being surgically attached to their phones, uh, it was exactly the same for them. Yeah. And uh, I can remember sitting in the in the desert at a place called Al Ruais, looking at a derelict building that essentially looked like an old toilet block. And a, and a guy in uniform walks up to me, and I'm thinking, gosh, I'm in trouble here, so I better very carefully explain what I'm doing with a machine long gun lens on my camera. Was there a machine gun anywhere inside? No, no, no but he, he, had a, he had a swagger to him that told me he was important. Uh, okay. And he smiled, and we got chatting, and it turned out he was an admiral in the Cattery Navy. And this building was his grandmother's home and he can remember visiting her in this home and so he he personified this transition from being a very poor nation that 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 lived as part of their natural environment to being a society which is now almost hermetically sealed away from the environment and um, it brought home a lot of those sorts of truths that 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 you read about you learn about and and to see it for real brought home just how quickly we as humans become detached from our yeah. natural environment. No, oh, indeed. That's a fascinating story. Thanks for sharing that. I think the next stage of your life, September 2014, that was directly after Qatar. Yes, it was. Uh, we had thought we'd be in Qatar for five years. That was the idea. It was a wonderful place for my son as well because he was of an age. He was also male. Therefore, it was easy for him to have his independence and get the best out of it. He made some great friends out there. Yeah. My daughter was younger and it was more difficult as, as a society, as a place for her growing up. And we made the decision that it was probably in her interest and our interest as a family to, to head back. Sure. 
but we didn't really fancy going back to the M25 and that no. routine. No, so how did you end up here? Well, credit to my wife. She found an advert in a paper. Right, OK. Another healthcare related Absolutely. post. Absolutely. And she said, how do you fancy the Isle of Man? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> All I knew about the Isle of Man was the Manx Cat, uh, the Laxey Wheel. Right. Um, the Triskelion, mm-hmm. the flag. Yep. I had read about, I think it was Ed Mackerel in the Guinness Book of Records, edition 1972, something like that. Really? Uh, I was talking about having my head in encyclopedias. I, yeah, I've no idea what that is. <laughs> the, the, the Guinness Book of Records. Was, oh, you know what about the Guinness Book of Records, <laughs> but Ed Mackerel, pardon? I might have the name wrong, so f- forgive me. Oh, okay. So, and uh, he was the last Manx speaking person. Oh, Ed Madrill. Ed Madrill. Was I, it Med, Ned, Ned Madrill? No. Ned Madrill, was Ned it? Ned Madrill. Ned Madrill, not Thank Ed Madrill. Thank you. I stand correct. Yeah. That's okay. It's like te- send reinforcements we're going to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I shall Good story. Re- remember that. Yeah. But that was all I, I knew about the Isle of Man. Yeah, sure. But I had this sense of it being in the Irish Sea it and, a, and a bit of an, an enigma, really. Yeah. Because, you know, I felt I was reasonably well educated. But in southern England, we learn nothing about the Isle of Man. No, and everyone thinks it's the Isle of Wight, don't they? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So we said yes, and um, my, my wife um, secured the contract. We came over for a visit before we took up our residency here. Yes. And um, that didn't put us off. Really? So there couldn't have been horizontal rain that day? <laughs> <laughs> I think I had it on my first day out, actually, but right. not, not on that particular visit. No such really. thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. Yes, absolutely. That's very good. So we made the move. Mm-hmm. And the only regret I have in moving here was that my son hasn't had the opportunity to join us because he had finished his sixth form studies in Qatar yeah. and was therefore going to university. Right. And he's never been a resident here. He's merely been a visitor. And I look at my daughter and how she's blossomed here. And, um, you know, half of me thinks, well, maybe we should have got here a bit sooner yeah. for the benefit of my son. Gosh, so where's he now? Is he he's still in the in the UK? Is he? He's in the UK. He's mm. working for a London firm. He's training to be an accountant. Right. Okay. So he's going through all his exams. There's plenty of accountancy firms here, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you never know. Maybe he'll get here one day. Yes. And uh, bring his trade with him. Yeah. But uh, for, for him, it's been quite disruptive yeah. living in London with COVID, mm. and it's a reminder for the family that is here that we are very lucky. Yeah. And w- w- whatever moans we might have about the difficulty of travel, actually, it's served us very well. It certainly has. Yeah, it's, uh, it has been great. So you're, um, so you're not, you, you became a trustee of the Manx Wildlife Trust sort of straight away. And, and how did you get into Manx Wildlife? Well, well I got to know people here yeah. um, in the nature, conserv- uh, nature conservation world. Um, and it was an invitation through Adam Dennard, who I had got to know. Right. And um, his mum was my was the uh, Thornton's first uh, member of staff. Funny enough, Sue. Oh. <laughs> Many years ago, we're talking twenty years ago. In fact. yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I say it's a small world. Isn't it is it? a small world. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm I'm still making those connections as I meet people around right. the island. Yes. Okay, so Adam um, got you involved, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, lovely. Uh, and it's not like me to sit still, so I got involved. Yeah, sure. And it was a, a tremendous way to understand how that aspect of the island works. Mm. Um, and and I, I think there's a salutary lesson as well. Um, I'm, I'm not always popular for saying this, but while the island is a beautiful place, it has a fantastic landscape. Mm-hmm. You know, there is genuinely a problem with what's in that landscape. And I th- uh, that, that drives me to want to try to help yeah. to make things a little bit better. Have you got any examples of, of that particularly? It's not a problem that's unique to the island, I would, would stress that. But it, it's, it's this consumption, this dilution and uh, this appropriation by us as people of everything around us without always the due regard for the fact that well, what we consume today, somebody tomorrow can't consume. Yeah. But it's this connectivity. It's a, it's a little bit hackneyed now, but I go back to the Qatar example, where, where you can go to other societies and realise how quickly they've become disconnected from the environment that is their life support system. Yeah. And, and it's not unique to societies such no. as Qatar. It, no. it's, it's everywhere. Chinese is probably one of the biggest examples of urbanisation, isn't it? 
Well, we've tipped that balance, haven't we? I think it's within the last two years that more than half the population now lives in an urban situation. Yeah. And, you know, we can all we can all talk about what the children know about the countryside, some children not knowing where milk or cheese comes from. And and that's pretty scary. Mm. But I think it's a bit more fundamental than that. And I think it's just that innate enjoyment and innate connection that we do have with the natural world that the way we educate our children the way we bring them up all serves to to disconnect them and we need to change that Mm. um you know not everyone's going to grow up like me with a head in encyclopedia and and find that the natural world is their their hinterland We, we all have our different passions and interests but I think we do have to recognise that money doesn't grow on trees, quite literally. But our lives depend on trees. And we have to think very carefully about um, the way we're behaving today. I don't know if you've listened to um, Dr. Mark Carney's Reith Lectures this week. I have, yes. He said that it, it, in, in such a, our society that our value and values are misaligned, so much so that Amazon is an ex- is a very large part of the U- U.S. stock market and valued at billions, trillions of dollars, and yet the Amazon appears on no bank balance, no no balance sheet anywhere, and yet what's you, more valuable? You know, it's funny, isn't it? Because we we like to think that we live in more enlightened times, but mm. I just think we live in more polarized times. And I think the recent Trump administration, the Bolsonaro administrations, are just examples of that polarisation. Yeah, indeed. And that tells us that the problem is really difficult. The problem is really complex. And I, I am obviously deeply invested in nature conservation, the process of nature conservation, the outputs of nature conservation. But if you ask me whether nature conservation has been successful, you know, I would reflect that the first national park, which was signed into being by, uh, I think it was the Ulysses Grant in eight, the 1870s, was Yellowstone National Park. And that was the start of the, the worldwide conservation movement. It really picked up after the Second World War. And so we, we've, we've had more than 100 years of nature conservation. Now, if nature conservation had been successful, then when you ask the question, well, should we have another 100 years like we've just had, we'd all go, yes. Actually, the last thing we want is a hundred years of nature conservation like we've just had. So again, it's this whole process of analysis and improvement. How do we get bigger, better, different in what we do? Because if we don't do it quickly and without being overly dramatic, it it will diminish future society. That's fundamentally. Without a doubt. And, you know, it's this whole thing about, come back to Mark Carney, price versus value. Yeah. You know, how do you put a price on something and what is the real value? Yeah, it's, it's well, yes. I mean, that moves us neatly, funnily enough, into what I was going to ask you, because, you know, my role is, is a financial planner. And if there's any more difficult relationship and psychology that you have as a human being, it's with money, the end of this yes. man-made substance that we're supposed to have a natural instinct in how to deal with. And of course, we don't. Yes. So, and you said before, money doesn't grow on trees. So I was just wondering if you, you know, if you don't mind me asking, how was money growing up we never wanted for anything but i think we were always conscious of the value of things um we were never profligate you know i can i can remember singing for the local choir cookfield church choir counting the pennies we would earn tuppence for a sunday service and fourpence for a wedding it took a long time to earn enough money to actually buy something other than sort of penny sweets um, I, I spent two years of my student life, in my, my, my A-levels, doing two eight-hour shifts a weekend at Gatwick Airport so I could afford to buy a bicycle. Gosh, a what were you doing there? there? I was working in catering right. with a company called Joe Lyons. Um, and that was in the days when they had four restaurants at Gatwick. And the height of ambition was to get to the Spectator's restaurant because it was at a part of the building that the supervisors never got to. So you had a bit of an easier life there. <laughs> and you could watch all the planes coming and going. Yeah, and I earned £9.96 for two eight-hour shifts on the weekend. Wow. What so, did you, living the high life. <laughs> well, so I think I've always appreciated, you know, the, 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 the value of yeah, things. Sure. Um, and I've, I've always had a love-hate relationship. You know, I totally understand economics in terms of why money's important. 
but I am frustrated that it's as much of a problem as it is um, the thing that, that, that allows us to express ourselves to acquire yeah. wealth and do the things that we really want to indulge in. Yeah. No, it is. So uh, to tell, me, tell me, Neil, of all, all the things that you've done throughout your, your life so far, what, what things that you've, have you done that's given you the most fulfilment from, from, a, from both a personal and a, you know, a, a career perspective? I, I would not say that my career or life has been planned out. Uh, you, 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 you see many people say you've got to have two year targets. You've got to move on after two years. I, I've never subscribed to that. I, I've mentioned that I want to do things which I feel are worthwhile and I get satisfaction from that. So I think what I take greatest pride from is the fact that I did take a decision that my career would be about doing things as much for myself as for other people. So in all the roles I've had, it's been a, a, an, an NGO third sector type role and I could always look back at the end of the week and say however difficult it has been as a job however frustrating I will have learned something yeah but actually I would have delivered something for somebody else at some point in that working week so what are you most and proud of and all that though I tend to not I tend not to reflect on it like like okay. that I, 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 I would say that some of the most difficult things are probably where I've had the greatest test of my character uh, both in terms of big, long-term, intractable projects that I thought would never come to an end. Um, we, we built for the Institute, uh, a gentleman called Simon Faraday and myself, um, the first commercial website for the Institute, which was a two-year project. And everybody thought, oh, you just build a website. Actually, of course, you've got to build the content management suite as well mm -hmm. you've got to build the data side of it etc etc so so the website is merely the front end of, of of the iceberg so two years we worked on that um we would be there at nine o'clock in the evening um unfortunately we had a, a wonderful indian takeaway next door so it was a frequent event to get the takeaway in yeah to sit there late at night and um that as an accomplishment felt pretty good because that, that website turned over millions of pounds right, okay. over the course of about a 10-year life. So I think we did a pretty good job with that. Yeah. Personally? I mean, personally, I think it's the family. Yeah. I, I have always said to my children that perhaps when we, 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 we first started as a family, I wasn't quite ready for it. I hadn't worked out what being a family was all about. When is anybody ever ready? <laughs> well, I, I think of... <laughs> Growing up as a manager yeah. in my work, my family's been my greatest asset because there is no better way to learn management than to have a family. Yeah, they don't come with an instruction book, do they? No, no, you have to work it out and you get it wrong. Yeah. And I've made my mistakes. And um, I, I think the fact that as a family, we've, we've managed now to develop four careers we're still reasonably sane. Um, we're all reasonably comfortable. And um, we get varying degrees of satisfaction from our work. Um, but the fact we're still together as a family, as a unit, you know, I think despite everything that we've been through, I, th I think that is hugely satisfying. Yeah, no, you're right. We had one particular challenge with the Institute, which was that we ran face-to-face um, -face learning programs. And that was the absolute core of the professional development program. And uh, I remember a conversation uh, with Derek, who is the managing director of the organization and, and the founder. And we, we both agreed we had to get, get into online learning. And plotting the path to taking the Institute's program to online learning, we had to move something like three quarters of a million words of learning material uh, I think it was about 2,000 hours of learning into the online space mm -hmm. very quickly at yeah. a very p low price. And again, that was a huge slog uh, to do that. Um, but we did it. Mm -hmm. And that then has become the mainstay of, of the Institute's programs. Fantastic. So I think from a technical achievement, accomplishment. That's, that, that is amazing. That probably and stands. what year was that? Oh, that's a very good question. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to fudge that for a minute. <laughs> It's fine, but it sounds like you're well ahead of many of the others who all of a sudden, a few months ago, found that, oh, why didn't we do this sooner? No, we, 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 we delivered our first online learning program fully before the Charlton Institute of Marketing. Yeah. So we, we're talking about 2008, something of that order. That's also. well in advance of so many professional bodies. Gosh, that's amazing. Well done. That is a huge achievement. Yeah. 
for any aspiring or um, or existing business owners or, or, or community leaders even, what would you be your number one business tip, Neil? Have you got one? Set your own standard. Right. We're, we're all seduced by people telling us what to do, how to do it. The greatest satisfaction will come from setting your own standard and living to that standard. I think integrity is hugely important. Um, I, I, I absolutely despise corruption. Yeah, me too. Uh, very idealistic, of <laughs> course. But I think if you set your own standards and you, you live by them, that is the greatest test. Yeah, you're so right. So what do you do to relax? How do you keep your life in balance? I think my family would tell you that I never do relax. Right. Uh, I'm always on the go. Okay. Uh, I, I use bird watching as my hinterland and I use that to relax and it's a bit like power napping I can I can take an hour out just watching the wildlife go by trying to find something a little bit special and that will do it for me that's yeah. my fix yeah over here what's what's the where do you do you go most most of all to to, well, to watch you've got the, the the place the airs reserve haven't you that um we have. I, I live in the south of the island at the oh, moment, okay. in Colby. Right. So for me, it's going out to either Langness or to Baina Karaki. I, yeah. I, I've always, always wanted to live near a coast. Right. And the great frustration of much of my career was that I was landlocked in, yeah. in Surrey. And still are London. in Colby. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the sea from Colby and that, that <laughs> makes a huge difference. <laughs> So, so just going for a walk around Baina Karaki, yeah. um, going for a skeet around Langness, Derby Haven, yeah. that, that's my fix. So would that be the best thing about living in the Isle of Man then, the fact that you can see the sea? From wherever you go. And uh, it, honestly, the, the, the best thing about living in the Isle of Man for me has been looking at the island through the eyes of my daughter, seeing how she has flourished from a fairly difficult period in Qatar to becoming a young lady. And I, and I think the quality of life here, I think the independence, the safety that the island provides to young people growing up is unrivaled. And were we living in Surrey still and my children growing up, it would be constantly saying, lock the windows, shut the doors, don't do this, don't do that. Here, it's a case of saying, of course you can do that. Go and yeah. enjoy yourself. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's great. But what, what would you say the main challenges are on the, on the, on the flip side? I think the island's facing huge challenges. Uh, the, the, the basic challenge is it's a small community, and yet it has everything that the UK has to grapple with. And I wouldn't be a politician. I take my hats off to people who would be politicians. I think they have an enormous job, a, a, a really difficult job to do here. I think it only works if there's a sense of realism. I think the island can't be everything that other jurisdictions are. It doesn't have the resources. So choose the things that you can be really good at. Do those well. And the things that you can't do, borrow them from people who are doing them well. You know, it's, it, it's the old thing in marketing that we used to say, you know, copyright is a rule, but only plagiarise the good stuff. <laughs> Very good. So those, so of, of the... Um of those challenges then what 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 would you focus on if it were you well for me i have to talk about nature conservation yeah. and, and i think we have to talk about brand isle of man I'm, I'm not sure we've yet worked out what brand isle of man is i think there's a really yeah it feels, deep exercise to it do fe- it feels it still feels a bit mile wide inch deep doesn't it yes yeah uh, the word unique, how many times do you hear the island being dis- defined as unique? Yeah, so many ways. And then you, then you, you ask why five times, yeah. the old trick of saying why, 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 and eventually yeah. you might get to the root of it. Mm. And the island is not unique for many of the reasons that people describe the coast, the landscape, the seas. Other places have that. Mm. So drilling down into why the island is unique, and for me it comes down to two things. It's the cultural heritage and the natural heritage. And the combination of those two things makes the island unique, sets it out as a destination, sets it out as a great place to live. And therefore, understanding those brand characteristics, thinking about the brand values, and then protecting those for all it's worth is one of the most important things because everything flows from that. Mm. If you get the core of the onion right, then all the layers around it are much easier. Yeah. And I, I, 
have been involved in conversations with Visit Art of Man, so thinking about how visitors appreciate what they get out of this place. But one, one stark example struck me only a week ago when somebody explained to me that the sea terminal is actually in the shape of the Triskelion. I had never realised that. I have no, walked through that building. You don't until you see a shot, an aerial shot of it. Think, oh, oh, what's that? Yes. Yeah, I know it is. And it's so intrinsically in there is yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. Which, Somebody had a great idea. Great idea. But it's nobody not else been re- has appreciated. No, no. Great ideas are pointless unless people appreciate them. Yeah. And that's what marketing's all about, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Absolutely is. And I, I, th- I think I would say as well that part of protecting that brand is not just about protecting the landscape, but it's protecting the nature that makes its home in that landscape. Because the better that nature is, the more diverse, the more secure, the more abundant the nature is, indicates to us that that landscape's in good condition. So for me as a nature conservationist, there's a huge focus Mm. on how we can restore the nature on on this island. Yeah, thank you. What have you got planned next, Neil? What's, 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 what's happening next? Well, from a professional point of view, it's the Point of Air yep. Reserve. Yep. Uh, it's a long-term project. It's potentially the biggest nature conservation project in a generation and for a generation it's here. exciting. We have to make a very brilliant job of the first parcel of land that we're working with right because there'll be more parcel of lands to come over time okay and it is just such a brilliant place and for me with all my interest in the outdoors in nature i i think it 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 will become an iconic part of the isle of man landscape yeah no that's uh, that sounds so exciting We, we we're definitely putting links for that into the show notes so that people can see how to, Thank to you. look and, and get involved in that. Um, but but um, just finally, if we can move on to um, just a qu- n- number of quick fire questions that our listeners just like to, to know. We, 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 we just go through, um, yeah, just a couple of questions. So, I mean, are, are there any books that you've read recently that you'd recommend? I mean, Christmas coming up, um, it's the time of this recording, but uh, obviously it's not going to be played until 2021. But what's, what's your sources of, of inspiration? I think one of the books that stands out for me recently has been a book called Bad Blood. Right. It's about the company called Theranos, which was a biotech startup in California yeah. that promised to provide in a, in a toaster-sized machine all the blood tests that you would need so that it would take the blood test, deliver the results within 20 minutes for over... 300 conditions um which is a a a, a bit like a panacea in terms of health services yeah and this company was led by a lady called elizabeth holmes she styled herself on steve jobs and she took billions and billions of dollars of investment it all got very nasty and the 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 bottom truth of it was this machine was never going to work it didn't work and they they spun this story that it was working it could work and it was going to be this great solution but they fleeced the market some very gullible investors people who had got rich by not being gullible but she managed to fool them Mm. and in the end it all just blew apart and that that for me was symptomatic of some of the things that are wrong with the way that that we use money yeah people will believe anything if it's sold and it sounds too good to be true it's amazing how many people fall for that every time because this time it's different and it never is well it's a wonderful story about the power of mm-hmm. persuasion yeah. of charisma and i i having read, read that and it's a very um contemporary read um i bought my daughter a book called life's a pitch by Don Peppers, <laughs> That's a great which title. is an old advertising yeah. book. Um, but again, it's about the fact that um, it's all about you, how persuasive you are, and carrying people with you. And it's a very different take. And I think the juxtaposition between the Don Peppers book, Life's a Pitch, which is rooted in real business success. Mm. He, this, this was an advertising executive from, from New York, the yeah. hardest place to pitch for advertising in the world, juxtaposed with the story of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, mm. I think is very revealing. Yeah, indeed. Great. Thank you. Um, so what is your, what's your favourite quote? Do you have one? My favourite quote is by Oscar Wilde. And it is 
I'm a person of routine. I'm very practical. And it's something that I always test myself against. And that consistency is the last resort of the unimaginative. <laughs> and it's a real test to say, are you thinking differently? Are you trying things? Are you experimenting? Are you breaking the bounds of the box? Because if you're doing is, all you're doing is sort of bouncing around inside the box, you're sort of falling foul of the Einstein quote, yeah. which is trying to do the same thing over and again, yeah. trying to achieve something different yeah. is, is an indication of insanity. Yes. And, and sometimes it feels like that. And if I look at where the solutions to the world's problems are, they are absolutely outside the box. And we're not thinking right at the moment. No. Have you read any of Matthew Syed's books, Rebel Ideas? Yeah, uh, yes. Black Box Thinking? Yes, yeah, yes. Fascinating books yes. like those. And, and I think you have to step aside from the gurus that, that write a lot of these things and, and the um, paradigms that they want to sell to you mm. and, and really get to the heart of the fact that thinking differently is dangerous because you're then seen as a maverick. You can be seen as very irrelevant and often it's time that will prove that some of the most outlandish thoughts are actually the ones where we want to be. And that's why I love physics, because physics is all about outlandish thinking. And sometimes they, they find a home and they find a place and they prove to be true. Yeah. Maybe I could add in terms of economics, yeah. that thinking's needed. Because if you think about it from a, a, a world perspective, economics is really just a giant Ponzi scheme. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have to feed it from the bottom. You have to keep the bottom growing. Yeah. It's all about quantitative growth. Mm. And if we're to solve some of these problems, we have to think about ceilings. We do have to have that really hard conversation about human population ceilings. But we have to think about qualitative growth, not quantitative growth. Yeah, indeed. And striving for that different model requires different thinking. And when you have the trumps of this world, that is a really hard thing to do. It's backwards, isn't it? So backwards. Because people will try to diss your credibility. Mm -hmm. And actually they're attacking you personally because they're too scared to attack the models and the things you're talking about yeah. because they actually have a sense and that... Climate change. Yeah, yes. that's very profound. That was the word I was looking for. So, Neil, thank you so much to, for today. But um, just quickly, where can people go to learn more about you? Manxbirdlife.im. Yes. So, www.manxbirdlife, all one word, okay. dot .im. That's our website. Everything you need to know about us is there. Yeah. And how about you? Um, you on LinkedIn or um, Twitter or anything? We're on Twitter, yep. at Manx Bird Life. Okay. We're on Facebook, right. Facebook slash Manx Bird okay. Life. That's brilliant. We'll put all those notes in, the, in, our, in our resources for the podcast. But um, And if you fancy dropping in for a cup of tea and a chat, we're, we're based above the commissioner's offices in Laxey. Great. And uh, you can come and find us there. And uh, we always welcome a discussion. We want to hear what you think of us, how we're doing, and, and ideas that you have about how we can do things better to help That's the really Isle of Man. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Neil. It's been a real pleasure getting to know you and talking to you today. So thank you so much for your help in, in the Island Influencers podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Island Influencers from Thornton Chartered Financial Planners. To find out more and for useful links, visit thorntonfs.com slash podcasts.